but I, I do want to make sure we just focus as much as we can um, on COVID and sort of uh, the issues that are arising for activists in general. Yeah, for sure. Um, oh, well, I mean, quickly, I'll just introduce myself, I guess. So my name is Evan Greer. I'm the deputy director of Fight for the Future. Um, we're a digital rights nonprofit that focuses broadly on human rights issues as they relate to technology. Um, and so we were founded in 2012. Probably the thing that people know us best for is the is you know building some of the tech and messaging behind the SOPA strike, uh, the internet blackout, and then um, organizing massive online protests around issues like net neutrality and government surveillance. Um, so you know we're in sort of a unique moment right now where it both feels like um, our core issues of internet freedom and um, opposing a really broad surveillance and civil liberties and human rights are like super essential and, and you know, as needed as ever before. Um, and also in a time where like um, a lot of those issues have become exponentially more complex um, and require a really high degree of specificity um, and um, kind of caution and, and, and thoughtfulness as we approach them. And I, I find myself um, you know, we're a very small organization. We tend to not be particularly risk averse. You know, like our, our social media policy is basically like, don't tweet if you're drunk, um, you know, but like we tend to just sort of like say what we think and be out there. Um, but I do find myself in this moment of uh, thinking of myself as an activist and, and kind of wanting to also like adopt a bit of the like Hippocratic oath, you know, like do no harm. Um, ideology as well and just like being really thoughtful and careful about what kinds of messages we're pushing out and um, and making sure that like first and foremost we don't say or do anything that's going to put people in danger um, and you know and then you know from there figuring out you know what should our positions be and and to me you know we're never an organization that's like well here's our position and that's like what we do to me it's much more important like what are the campaigns what is the actual action that we can and should take in this moment. Um, so, I mean, I can quickly go over some of the campaigns and the issues that you know seem like they're bubbling up that Fight for the Future is focused on. Um, I wanted to quickly just like show a couple things if that seems okay, Sean. Um, all right, let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Um, share my screen. All right, I'm sharing a screen now. Um, okay, so now you're looking at an infinite, uh, I love this cascading windows of, um, it reminds you when, do you remember when you used to win at free sell or, or not free sell? What was that game that was like on Windows? Oh, free sell. Was free sell, okay, yeah. When you would win at free sell, it would do this and it was cool. But anyhow, I wanted to start by actually showing some, another event that's happening that's live right now, um, which is Earth Day Live, um, which is organized by youth climate activists. Um, and, you know, because of the pandemic, they were forced to move their plan, um, which was to hold uh, massive in-person strikes and rallies and protests around the world on Earth Day, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. They had to move that entire event online. Um, and so um, we actually came in to support them with that um, since we've organized so many large online events. Um, and they managed to pull together this like absolutely incredible lineup. It's like AOC and Dave Matthews Band and Questlove and, um, you know, Ani DeFranco and Jason Emraz and a bunch of awesome folks. Um, but yeah, they've had, you know, I think more than 100,000 folks watched full stream yesterday. Uh, you can see at the top here, there's, you know, almost 3,000 people watching right now um, as um, some youth and others are discussing their activities. Um, but I think this is a great example of, you know, just because we can't gather in person doesn't mean that we can't um, engage in meaningful activism, you know, and of course, not just, this isn't just about watching the stream, but this actually involves, um, you know, pledging to vote. And if you um, go ahead and do this, um, it then also makes it possible for you to register to vote, um, other things like that. So, you know, just one example I figured I would start with of, um, you know, some of the ways that folks are moving their activism online during a time when it's very difficult to do activism in person. Um, so then I figured I would start by kind of jumping to fight for the futures campaigns and specifically kind of our our signature campaign around COVID itself and um, and the associated concerns around privacy and civil liberties and human rights. Um, so this was our main campaign. It's take this seriously org. And basically what we're you know really calling for is for people to take this <laughs> I know I just said that, but to take this seriously, which to us means listening to public health experts, 
um, doing our part to practice social distancing, help flatten the curve, um, but also to commit to fighting back against attempts by both governments and corporations to exploit this crisis, um, to push for things that don't actually have a public health benefit, um, but endanger people's basic human rights. And again, I think that requires a, a fair degree of specificity. So unlike some of our pages that are basically just like, here's the big headline, save the internet, sign the form. Um, you know, we've really taken some time to really lay out um, really specific points here. So for example, around issues like surveillance, you know, we think it's really, you know, there's ways in which, um, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just come back so I can talk to you all. Um, you know, uh, obviously, the big conversation right now that's happening is around issues of contact tracing. And, um, you know, I'd be happy or excited to get into kind of a, a more substantive conversation about that. Um, but generally speaking, you know, contact tracing itself is not a bad idea. It's something that's been used in epidemiology for a long time. Um, and there are ways to do it um, that are not particularly invasive. Um, you know, Massachusetts, my state, um, is hiring a huge amount of people, which is a great because they're hiring people from the community, um, particularly from communities that are hard hit, um, where people are losing jobs, and they're basically paying them to call people on the phone who've tested positive, ask them um, if they will voluntarily share um, names and phone numbers of people that they came into close contact with recently, and then they're calling those people and telling them, hey, you came in contact with someone that um, that tested positive, and you know we'd encourage you to go get a test. That is great. Um, that is the type of stuff that we need. It makes perfect sense, especially in conjunction with widespread testing, which obviously we need. What makes a lot less sense is what, for example, um, you know, the government of Israel was doing, um, or what we've seen proposed by some companies in the U.S. Um, for where governments might mandate. Um, that, for example, internet service providers just hand over en masse real-time location data. Um, you know, that doesn't really have a meaningful public health benefit, and it comes with, you know, just an incredible temptation for mission creep. Um, that's the type of thing that could enable, um, you know, really invasive mass surveillance. Um, and so that's the type of stuff that we're concerned about. It gets a little bit more complicated when you look at, for example, the proposal that Apple and Google have put out um, to use Bluetooth tracing. Um, and frankly, you know, Apple and Google are not my favorite companies. And I think for the most part, um, I don't particularly trust them. Um, that said, on paper, what they have proposed, I think makes a lot more sense than some of these, you know, other proposals, like I mentioned, like sharing actual location data. Um, and so I think it's going to require us to just be a little bit thoughtful. Like my temptation as an activist is always just to be like, we don't like this thing, kill it with fire. Um, but I think in this moment, we really just need to be careful and specific um, and thoughtful and make sure that we're not just making blanket statements because they sound good on Twitter, um, but that we're really diving in um, and getting real about which proposals make sense, which proposals come with a public health benefit and are actually backed up and recommended by um, science, and which things are just kind of authoritarian power grabs. Um, so I'll pause there for a second and, and, and Sean, feel free to jump back in or with questions or I, I think I'm looking at the chat. Um, yes. Okay. I see the chat. So, you know, folks should feel free to, to jump in if they have questions or thoughts and um, otherwise I'm happy to kind of, you know, just kind of keep plowing ahead with, with more stuff like this. Let's pause a little bit for the, the contact tracing. Uh, huge issue. Uh, basically, we decided to do a session on it. Um, so right. I spoke about it this morning. And uh, I kind of was kill it with fire. <laughs> Not completely. Yeah. I talked about Massachusetts, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but we talked a little bit about the Google, Google slash Apple proposal, et cetera. Um, so there are a lot of folks, this is great that we're covering it again, um, who missed that session or were asking about it. So it, it's good to uh, sort of hammer home. Um, I guess from my perspective, uh, even if the proposal is better than uh, a proximity tracing Bluetooth app, right? Maybe it's just a voluntary database, right? That uh, that Google has control of. I still um, have a strong skepticism about the centralization of that data, um, and obviously, as you said, you know, frankly, Google is not my favorite company. Um, so, what do you think about that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think I think skepticism is the right way to be approaching this in, in every direction, right? We should be skeptical about claims that data that's collected for public health purposes will only be used for public health purposes, right? History would show us that once the government collects or possesses data, 
they will use it for whatever they want and it will get shared um, you know, throughout the government used for law enforcement purposes, immigration enforcement purposes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the way that Apple and Google have proposed to do this does sort of prevent like, you know, like some of the worst or most egregious things like that, at least in theory. But again, it's sort of about like, you know, some things that I would want to see is like, there's no reason why the code for this shouldn't be completely open source. There's no reason why um, they can't put, you know, like real provisions in place so that there is like complete transparency that like all of this will get deleted at a certain point and like we'll be able to go and like check and make sure that it actually was deleted, for example. Um, you know, I think, um, and then I think there's just like, we just need more specifics, right? Like we sort of understand how this thing is gonna work, but you know, not really, right? And, and, and it's also not clear to me how any of this really has much of a benefit absent widespread testing. And so I think that's the other piece too, is just sort of like, why are we talking about tracking everyone when we haven't even figured out yet how we're going to test everyone? That said, I don't know that that's a, uh, you know, I don't think you can kind of end the conversation there because I do think by the time something like this was able to even get widespread adoption, um, it's much more likely that that widespread testing would be would be happening. You know, that said, I think I share your broad skepticism. And another concern for me is just, um, normalizing the process of self-surveillance, right? And I think that that is also really scary. Um, and so I think we just need to be, you know, really cautious around it. I think another piece for us or where where we feel pretty confident, where we're like, okay, we know that we are feel comfortable opposing this is around enforcement or like the kind of edges of this, right? It's one thing if people, you know, people make apps that theoretically do this type of tracing and people voluntarily decide they want to use them. Um, it's a totally different thing if your employer requires you to have this on your phone in order to enter your, your place of work or a city requires you to show proof that you're using it in order to get on the subway um, or go into a store or go into a government building. Um, especially since there's large numbers of people that don't even have smartphones, right? Are we just supposed to tell them that they can't participate in public life because they can't download an Android app? Um, you know, so I think there's like real things around the implementation there that um, that will that will likely be what we will be focusing on and campaigning around. You know, frankly, I think at this point it seems you know I, I tend to be a bit of a pragmatist when it comes to strategy and. I don't really see a path toward like stopping this thing from happening, even if we thought it was a good idea to stop it. And so for me, it seems to be focused around um, how do we fight against the really, really egregious and bad ways that this could go and make sure that the worst proposals get struck down um, and and that we have you know enough scrutiny and oversight on the least worst proposals um, you know, as they move ahead. Which yeah, and I'll just acknowledge that that is like a rare, you know, like we are the organization that made banned facial recognition seem like not a radical proposal. So like it's, you know, we are not often in in the um, place of being this kind of nuanced about um, policies. We tend to be pretty like, you know, um, radical about stuff. But I think that is just the reality of the of the moment is is a need for, for care um, on on both ends of this. Yeah, and I think that you pinpoint, and we had a wonderful physician on as well, a public health expert, uh, uh, Trisha Greenhalgh. Uh, she's in the UK, but um, I asked her about it. And same thing, the testing is really what needs to be there. Otherwise, it's sort of just like a, an annoying notice at some point, right? If you can't get a test for it, and all your friends are now also getting these notices from apps, totally. what's the utility anyway? Uh, well, and also, you know, this also speaks to like the broader issues around a social safety net and think, you know, if if you are living paycheck to paycheck and you need to go into work to feed your children and you get a text message that says like, yeah, maybe you came within six feet of someone who tested positive. Are you really going to then stay home for 14 days and not collect a paycheck if there isn't like something in place that says, OK, if you get one of these notifications, then like, you know, they're, you're going to be taken care of in some way. Um, you know, so I think, again, it's there, there's there's so many different ways in which this interacts. Um, so I can see someone in the chat um, kind of asking, like, what are the worst proposals, right? And I do think it's really, it, it's valuable to distinguish. Um, and, and part of the, one of the things that I hope comes out of this is just that we deepen people's understanding of the different types of data 
that gets collected by cell phone companies, by folks that make apps and games and things that you use on your phone, by companies like Facebook and Google, et cetera, and kind of like tease out the different like types of data that gets collected, how it gets collected, what the situation has been and what it is. Because another thing that's kind of funny about all the location tracking stuff is that like we're basically already living in the nightmare scenario that I think we're afraid of, right? Like we know that for the last many years, the like internet service providers like AT&T were just straight up collecting and selling our real-time location data to basically anyone who would buy it. Um, you know, that got exposed over the last year. Now most of the big carriers have kind of pinky sweared that they won't do it anymore. Um, and the FCC even slapped them with like a totally slap on the wrist fine. Um, you know, that, but, you know, but the reality is that um, there's still just an enormous for-profit market for location data collected by um, all kinds of different companies and data brokers. Um, and so, you know, and, and in fact, the government has, has often just purchased that data because it was easier to purchase um, than to, you know, like go through the legal channels to obtain it. Um, you know, ICE was doing that with, um, to target undocumented folks. You know, they, they could have gone and gotten an administrative subpoena, but they were like, eh, fuck it, let's just buy it from the data broker, which is kind of wild, right? right. But I do think it's valuable just to recognize that because when we think about like, all right, well, what's the worst thing that could happen from this contact tracing thing? And if we bring ourselves to like, well, the worst thing that could happen is that people's real-time location data could be leaked. It's like, well, <laughs> that's basically already happening. Um, it, but I think that points to the need to, in this moment, we should be fighting to close that loophole. And I think we should argue, all right, Google and Apple, you want to do this? All right, government, you want to do this? then you should pass comprehensive federal data privacy legislation so that we can actually trust um, that this data will be safeguarded and that there will be real consequences for those um, who, who don't do so. So I see someone asking, who should we be contacting to demand oversight? So I think there's like a few different categories here. Congress is the obvious one. Um, you know, again, Congress has been dragging its feet on meaningful federal data privacy legislation for years. Really, the only thing Congress has done on data privacy was to repeal the only meaningful protections we had in place, which were the broadband privacy rules, um, and gut them. Um, so with you know, lawmakers in Congress, you know, seeing who within Congress should, should, is the lead, you know, and there's different committees that lead this. It's the Commerce Committee. It's um, judiciary is involved in data privacy legislation. That's part of why it's kind of gotten slowed down is there's a number of different committees that are kind of involved in this. Um, but really, you, you know, you should be contacting your member of Congress, your senator, um, your senators rather, um, and you know, telling them that you want real meaningful federal data privacy legislation. Fight for the Future has a site here. I'll drop it in the chat. Um, it's a little outdated at this point, but still gets the job done. Fightforprivacy.co. Um, you know, that's a simple form that you can fill out that contacts, um, you know, your member of Congress and both your senators all at the same time. Um, and, you know, I think there's going to be a bit of an inside the beltway play around this. Um, but really, you know, it's about making it a priority right now. You know, Nancy Pelosi has basically said outright, like, you know, we're not really even considering anything in these packages other than basically just like, where are we throwing money? Um, and, you know, I understand, <laughs> like, you know, the, the urgent need for that. Um, but I think, you know, we need a public outcry that says, like, private internet privacy is more important now than ever before. People are sitting at home talking with their therapists, their doctors. Our children are going to school on the internet. Um, we need real protections in place. Um, and, you know, and I think it's also important to recognize that that's not a trade off. Um, privacy is essential for people's safety. And so if Congress is dragging its feet and not doing its job and putting these protections in place, they are putting people in danger the same way that they're putting people in danger by not taking appropriate steps to address this pandemic. So I think it's not an either or, um, you know, this is something that we need to be fighting for as a top, um, you know, a top priority in this moment. Sure, and I, I didn't mean to flash a bunch of stuff in your face, but I uh, uploaded the um, presentation from this morning. I'll make sure everybody uh, who attends the conference has access to everyone's slides. Um, this has the Google proposal here. I don't know if it's worth going into in detail. I think your summary was fine. Um, but basically the dominant proposal right now is the dominant proposal from the two owners of the Android and iOS 
uh, phone ecosystem. So 90 to 99 percent of the phones out there. Um, so I mean, without without going into and comparing and so on, the data nightmare you're talking about we're already living in, right? Um, but this is sort of an opportunity for that to be accelerated. Um, do you think, Evan, that that some of this stuff is uh, going to play off of earn IT or maybe even end up in the bill? So I would say the earn it act is related, but but separate. Um, the earn it act, um, which is legislation introduced by Lindsey Graham and Senator Blumenthal, um, is basically a thinly veiled attack on end to end encryption. Um, and as you know, many previous attacks on end to end encryption have been. It's framed as a bill to combat child exploitation online, um, which is obviously a real problem that does need to be addressed, um, and that um, you know obviously is like very like emotional and visceral for people, which makes a lot of sense. Um, the the Earn It Act would not really meaningfully do anything to actually combat child exploitation. Basically, what it would do is it would give the Department of Justice, currently run by Bill Barr, the ability to set guidelines for tech companies and basically say, if you're not following these guidelines, you're not doing enough to, um, you know, in our view, to combat this, and therefore we can revoke your protections under uh, CDA 230, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. This is sort of like a, this is like a burrito of bad ideas, basically. So, you know, it's an attack on CDA 230, which has been referred to as like the 32 words that created the internet, 32, 26, I forget how many words it is. I can't remember either. <laughs> Maybe neither, um, you know, but essentially this is the, the law that allows for all um, user generated content on the internet. It's the law that makes it so that if I upload a video to Facebook of me doing something totally wild, um, Facebook is not liable. Um, Facebook should theoretically take it down if it's harmful, um, but they are not liable for content that their users post. Um, and you know, th it's been much maligned in recent years by both Democrats and Republicans. So there's this sort of growing um, consensus among people who don't really understand how this law works, um, who are using it as kind of a um, catch-all um, cudgel to beat up on tech companies who they don't like. Um, and, you know, the tech companies haven't done themselves any favors, um, and they certainly deserve to be criticized, criticized and, and frankly, they totally do deserve to be beaten up. Um, but doing it in this way actually puts a tremendous number of people at risk. Um, and I think particularly right now, again, going back to the fact that so much of our incredibly sensitive personal conversations and lives have moved online, um, anything that undermines end-to-end -end encryption in this moment is putting people in danger. Um, you know, if anything, services should be rolling out end-to-end -end encryption um, as much as possible. We have a petition calling for Zoom to actually implement end-to-end -end encryption as they previously claimed to and then admitted that they actually weren't. Um, but, you know, this is something, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is, is what protects um, our hospitals, our power plants, our water treatment facilities. Um, it's an absolutely ridiculous and absurd idea to do anything to undermine it or put a back door in it. Um, and doing so is actually going to put children in danger, not protect them. Um, so I would say, you know, in terms of how that all relates back to things like contact tracing and, um, you know, kind of like pandemic related surveillance, I see it as just sort of like a in the soup of bad ideas that are out there right now. Um, you know, I, I would be surprised to see the Earn It Act show up in one of these spending bills or something like that. But, you know, we need to be vigilant. It, you know, we've seen crazier things happen. Um, you know, they there was at least some discussion on the Hill of, um, you know, including a reauthorization of some Patriot Act provisions in one of the earlier um, coronavirus spending packages um, that ended up getting shut down thanks to privacy activists, um, you know, screaming about it. Um, but, you know, at, at this point, I wouldn't put anything past them. You know, so I do think it's important that we remain vigilant and also that we have a, a thoughtful approach to this. You know, we, I, I, I'm concerned about the fact that we're seeing this start to play out in a partisan way where the media is kind of hyping up these, like, you know, these reopen America protests, et cetera, um, which, you know, I obviously disagree with most of what those folks are calling for, but we can't have a world where like the position of the left is like, shut up and just do what the government says. Um, you know, that's as, like that's just going to drive more people toward, um, you know, really dangerous ideologies. And so I think it's really important that we fight for, 
you know, having kind of a rational, but also anti-authoritarian approach to, um, you know, these conversations and, you know, being skeptical of um, powerful institutions and, and asking questions and making sure that there's space for robust debate. Because if there's one thing that we need now more than ever, it's for people to be able to question um, the um, approaches that their government is taking, the approaches that corporations are taking, um, and have like real conversations about what we should and shouldn't be doing. Right. So I think for me, one of the things that's very inspiring about the work you do, the work that Fight for the Future does, um, is your ability to uh, mobilize people electronically, you know, digitally, but also tie that to real world in-person um, actions well. Um, doing that via, you know, organizing uh, email lists and, and uh, petitions and text messaging uh, outreach and asking people to call their congressperson and so on. Um, all that's really, really awesome, but I imagine it's going to change a little bit given the way that people are now um, at home, in lockdown, and maybe even after this kind of in meetings like this. Um, so what do you think might change about that? And are you already sort of thinking about how that might move? Yeah, I mean, in a funny way for us, like things haven't changed that much just because we, you know, Sure, we you know we've organized you know many in person events and in person protests and even like you know we organized like the Rock Against the TPP tour, which was like a nationwide series of rock concerts um, around the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement. So you know there's always been some level of ground game, but for us most of our power has always been around channeling kind of generalized internet outrage into like you know the exact action that needs to happen in any given moment, which is usually you know drive like a flood of phone calls to exactly the right lawmakers or, you know, a flood of tweets at the right CEO at the right moment when they're like freaking out about something or, you know, that kind of like online political power. Um, and so in a funny way, it's like every other organization in the world is now like figuring out is like now kind of like heading in the direction that we've been in for a little while. So part of what we're trying to do is just figure out how to kind of share our play, like open source our playbook a little bit. Um, and even some of our tools, you know, we've, so like the, you know, we had to build something, you know, like most petitions that you sign are kind of bullshit <laughs> to be frank. Um, you know, you sign the petition, it doesn't actually go anywhere. Um, you know, we've actually built a fairly elaborate apparatus to make it possible for people to easily email their members of Congress. Um, and so like, that's something we've been offering over the years to, you know, mostly just to like our close friends um, in the internet freedom space. But we're now looking at, you know, how can we open source that, and make it more available to more organizations? Um, how can we, you know, provide technical support for organizations that are moving their protests online? How can we, you know, can we produce some guides or, or best practices for people who are doing, you know, big live streams where you have, you know, 500 different guests in different, you know, countries, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I think for us, it's like not a lot has changed beyond that there's just like, an enormous number of people that are now, you know, kind of like looking to do some of the things that we have learned how to do over the years. And so we're just trying to find the best way to, you know, to, to help folks um, across a wide range of different issue areas and movements to do that. So uh, we've got some uh, conversations, great conversations in the uh, chat here. Um, they sort of are hinging around um, power relationships and, and, you know, what kind of leverage do we have, so to speak, um, against telcos, uh, or not against telcos per se, but to bring them into line with democratic principles. Um, you know, what can we do? How can we get allies to be engaged and in contact with each other? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think if there's, you know, if there's one thing that I've learned as an activist, it's that anything is possible, um, you know, or like we need to like think about the realm of what is possible, not so much, you know, like the, the traditional logic is basically like, okay, like how many lobbyists do you have? Like how close of a relationship do you have with X number of senators who are on the right committees to move the bill, et cetera. And there's a lot of groups that that do that work very effectively and, and we work closely with them and, and we wouldn't be able to do what we do without kind of that inside the beltway chess game. Um, but, you know, what what happens when you're like really in that world is, again, you, you think about what is possible within this bubble of like, well, what's possible by me kind of like working my like relationships? 
Whereas I tend to think of like, what would be possible if I could get 100 million people to call Congress in a single day? You know, what would be possible if, you know, there were, if like, you know, we were able to make this niche tech policy issue, um, you know, like the most talked about issue of the day for a week or something like that, like we did with net neutrality, right? So I think, um, you know, just trying to reframe how we think about what's possible um, is is how we leverage power. Um, and, you know, one thing I've learned is like, you know, oftentimes we think of like lawmakers or politicians as if like they're the enemy, right? And like our goal is to like beat up on them. And like, you know, I, th there, there are very few politicians who I like or would like personally want to go get a beer with. But what I've really learned or, or figured out is that most of activism is not so much around directly um, pushing on them, but it's around changing the political situation around them so that they suddenly feel like the thing that you're calling for is not only possible, but is preferable to not doing it. Um, and that's, you know, whether you're pressuring, you know, even with a more friendly administration, like we had to fight tooth and nail to get net neutrality, uh, uh, you know, protections passed under the Obama administration, but really it was about making it less painful for them to do what we wanted than to not do what we wanted. Um, and to me, that's how we leverage power. Um, it's about, um, you know, sheer numbers. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, like the right messenger, like with net neutrality, you know, we really had to convince some Republican members of Congress. And so, lever you know, mobilizing small, small business owners was actually the most impactful thing we did that, you know, we were able to directly hear from the Republican members of Congress that voted in favor of net neutrality that the number one reason that they did so was because they heard from small business owners in their district that this was important to them. And so like that was a very specific piece that we can move on the chessboard. And like mobilizing small business owners is not like normally what I think of as my job. But for those two months, that was my job because that was the thing that needed to happen in order to win. Um, and so I think just like getting very ruthless um, and, and always be asking yourself, not like, you know, what makes me look good? What's my, what is like consistent with my ideology? What is, you know, good for my brand on Twitter? It's like, what do we fucking need to do to win? And I think we, you know, we as activists need to think of ourselves a bit more as mercenaries um, who are like there to do a job. You know, soldiers are like there to follow orders, right? Or to like wave a flag. Mercenaries are there to do a job and they're not gonna be happy until their job is done. And so I, try, I think it's important that activists adopt a bit of that mercenary mindset, you know, which doesn't mean that you don't have like a core set of values or ideology that are driving what you do, but it's not enough to just be like, well, we, you know, we stuck to our guns and, and, and lost again, but like, you know, but we, but we really tried. You know, like I don't pat myself on the back for really trying. Um, you know, it's it is I do not sleep well at night unless I feel like I've done everything I can to win um, on the issues that matter that impact people's lives. So that was great. And in putting it in that context, I think it's going to be so important um, as the ground literally shifts beneath our feet. Um, so the circumstances around that and mobilizing people is going to be so central. It's going to be huge. Um, so just to uh, bring up some more questions from the chat here, um, we had someone ask about who the groups are, and I think this has to do with uh, the groups you mentioned that uh, do lobby politicians as well as the uh, digital freedom groups that you work with. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a huge coalition of organizations that, that we work with on, you know, a wide range of issues, um, you know, on net neutrality specifically. Uh, you know, a lot of our core allies were Demand Progress, uh, you know, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, groups like Color of Change and Media Justice and the National Hispanic Media Coalition, who really focused on the disproportionate impact of um, telecom abuses on communities of color and low income communities. Um, on surveillance issues, we work quite a bit um, with, you know, with some of those same organizations, as well as uh, immigration justice activists like Mijente. Um, and Cosecha, um, we work with, um, you know, uh, you know, we also, you know, we, it's a pretty broad coalition, you know, on Patriot Act stuff, we work with some groups on the right, um, like Freedom Works and, um, uh, you know, libertarian activists and um, Campaign for Liberty, um, et cetera, who have been, you know, really actually very consistent on issues um, of, um, surveil you know, opposing overly broad government surveillance. 
Um, you know, so it's really a wide, a wide coalition of organizations um, that are out there doing really great work. Um, and you know, for us again, you know, we always try to build build the biggest party that we can. Um, you know, if you look at some of our different campaigns, like our our band facial recognition campaign, um, you know, it's a pretty broad range of organizations that um, come together around some of this stuff. You know, on facial recognition, we also partnered, you know, and, and Sean, you know this, um, because we, I think that's how we originally got in touch with you, but we partnered with Students for a Sensible Drug Policy, um, who are a national organization of students that work um, on the ways that the drug war has impacted people. Um, and we ran a campaign that helped get more than 60 of the most prominent educational institutions in the country to commit to not using facial recognition on their campuses. Um, so, you know, it's really a, a broad range of folks that we work with. And um, for me, I'm excited to work with anybody that's like, you know, willing to do the work. To me, you know, that willingness to do the work is more important than um, what you say in your mission statement or your About Us page. Um, you know, I want to see people out there fighting. Could you talk a little bit about the uh, face surveillance FRT um, situation, um, how it may or may not have changed because of COVID? And also can, um, well, you know what, I'll hold on the next question because it's a very deep one. Okay, cool. Um, sure, so I mean, face surveillance continues to be a, a real threat. You know, we see facial recognition um, when used for surveillance purposes as akin to nuclear or biological weapons in the sense that it's a technology that poses such a profound threat to humanity, to basic human rights, um, that there really is no meaningful way to put limitations on it. We think it should be banned outright. Um, and, you know, I think in terms of how it's changed in this moment, you know, I think the biggest change is just that the companies that make this technology, um, you know, I, I don't know, it's like you could, it's like get yourself someone who looks at you the way that a facial recognition vendor looks at a global pandemic um, or a pandemic. As my nine-year-old yelled at me the other day, global pandemic is redundant. Um, however, you know, they see this largely as a business opportunity. And I've already seen like super grody press releases from facial recognition vendors being like, oh, facial recognition is a sanitary technology, um, you know, that you can use to like open doors and do all this other stuff in ways that will, you know, et cetera. So I think that's the biggest thing is just that, you know, we continue to be concerned about the ways that um, companies that make this type of invasive surveillance technology will exploit or weaponize crises like this. You know, some of the more horrifying ways I could imagine this happening are like, there's some really good things happening. Like, for example, the Philadelphia police said they were going to stop arresting people for nonviolent offenses because anything that puts more people behind bars right now is making this crisis worse. Um, that's great. You could totally imagine a facial recognition vendor saying, well, hey, since you're not going to arrest those people for nonviolent offenses, why not use facial recognition and just mail them a citation for smoking weed on the street or loitering or whatever it is, right? You could totally imagine facial recognition vendors pitching the government on using facial recognition to enforce social distancing, for example, um, which would be, you know, again, incredibly invasive um, and, um, and something that could, you know, would, would have inevitable mission creep. So I think, you know, our, we, we, we remain committed to fighting um, for legislation that puts a federal ban on the use of facial recognition for law enforcement and surveillance purposes. We think it should be banned for corporate and institutional use as well in almost every case. Um, and, you know, I think our, the, the current situation has only um, made that more urgent. Very well put, um, something that obviously I think everyone's afraid of uh, in this environment uh, is these FRT vendors suddenly becoming the saviors, um, as you point out, uh, or the proposed saviors. Um, okay, so we have a question here. How can we forge a shared interorganizational resource alliance, leadership, privacy protocols, and training, and more, so that we can build leaders who can build their own cells of freedom engagement? Etc. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, you know, I mean, I guess one thing I would I would say is like, for everyone who's kind of interested in the space, is just like make sure that let's make sure that we like learn about what's already there before we um, you know kind of assume that something new needs to be built. I think you know I'm a chronic like starter, so like I'm always kind of like let's do a thing. And I always have to remind myself, like, well, maybe I should go like figure out if people are already doing a thing 
um, that I can support rather than starting something new. You know, I think there's a lot of existing networks in, in ways that, you know, national, um, you know, privacy, civil liberties, human rights organizations communicate with each other. I think that's often a little bit obscured from the general public, and I think that's a real problem. Um, and it's also obscured from local organizations. Um, you know, something that Fight for the Future is talking about or thinking about doing is building out an actual tool or product that would make it easier for, for example, like a small local organization, like a student group, or like a like a very like hyper local nonprofit that focuses on like a specific neighborhood to ask for help from national organizations. Say, hey, we've got, you know, a big vote coming up in our city council. We could really use, you know, more people calling in. They could send a message to a group like Fight for the Future. We could rope in our friends at Daily Coast and move on and color of change. And we could all send emails to our large email lists and drive thousands of phone calls to that city council ahead of that vote that that local group would never have been able to generate and that we would never even have known that the vote was happening if they hadn't contacted us. So I think we need more things like that. Um, but I think it's it's also about how do we leverage existing networks um, and existing relationships um, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel over and over again, which I think tends to happen sometimes in movement spaces. I don't know if that actually answered the question or not, but that's what that's I got. Right. It's all food for thought, right? Um, and I think that the core of it, w which I kind of glossed over and skipped over, was the idea of having sort of um, small groups of people who are well-trained and can sort of do actions without necessarily uh, being surveilled as easily. Right. So, I mean, that you know, in some ways, that's a totally different um, topic or, or, you know, and, and I'm, you know, I mean, I take basic steps to protect myself and my family, but definitely other folks that would be great trainers on the issue of digital, you know, self-defense, basically. Um, you know, I think, I think also it's really important that folks just like think about what their actual threat model is, you know, like we can get a bit bogged down in like freaking out about our privacy as activists um, when, you know, sometimes it's actually like not that, like it's actually not the top concern. And we're like, we're organizing something that's like, you know, we may as well just like organize it in a public Google Doc because who cares? Who knows what we're doing? Um, you know, if you're doing something that's more sensitive and does require, um, you know, some level of security, then you know, then you should do that. Um, but I think just like being, you know, being not not feeding paranoia or kind of like general, you know, like bogging people down or, or shaming people who you know don't use Signal or whatever. Um, I think we need to be you know welcoming people in um, rather than kind of being like, well those idiots use zoom so what did they expect um you know like that type of um thinking doesn't help anyone um and it's it's just elitist frankly and leaves a lot of people behind yeah you have to meet people where they're at right yeah. um so we have two questions that are related to frt um the first one is about masks and it's sort of uh, formed around the idea, do we know, what do we know right now about uh, how well facial recognition works if you're wearing a mask? Yeah, so I think it varies from vendor to vendor, but I've certainly seen a bunch of stories about, um, you know, with China specifically, where, you know, A, facial recognition is more widespread, and B, you know, they're sort of have now kind of gone through this um, in some ways, or, you know, people have been wearing masks consistently for quite some time. Um, and my impression is that it's actually not a huge deal for them to figure out how to use, do facial recognition while you're wearing a mask. Um, you know, it can detect things like how far apart your eyes are from each other, things like that. Um, so, you know, it's it's not a foolproof, you know, we shouldn't just assume that, oh, well, you know, now that everyone are wearing masks, facial recognition won't work. Um, you know, and I see someone in the chat um, talking about, you know, recognition of how you walk, gait recognition, that's absolutely true. Um, you know, we talk about facial recognition specifically, but the reality is you know, there's a number of different types of technology that can be used to um, to identify a person in public, essentially. Uh, I know Bruce Schneier has written a bit about this, um, and we've gone back and forth a bit on it. And, you know, his argument is basically that, you know, forget about banning facial recognition. We should ban the practice of involuntarily de-anonymizing someone in public. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter what technology you use to do it. Um, anything that you use to essentially figure out who someone is from a crowd for the purposes of discrimination. And I mean discrimination in a sort of technical sense, not even necessarily that, like you're going to harm that person, but for the purpose of being like, this is who this person is and we're going to treat them a certain way because of that. 
um, you know, like that, that entire practice should be banned outright. Um, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I don't know exactly how you do that from a legislative perspective, but um, but you know, I think Bruce is fundamentally right. Um, you know, in, in some ways, facial recognition is symbolic of you know a, a particularly invasive type of surveillance. Um, but really, there's a whole set of technologies that can be used. Um, you know, to to do sort of similar things. Yes, I see someone just posted Bruce's uh, essay on that. Um, which is great. I read a question a little higher up in the chat um, about um, some people calling for a, not a ban, a ban's too much. Uh, we should just ban specific use cases of the technology. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, my general sense, like I mentioned before, is um, I really believe that facial recognition specifically, um, but I, I think, you know, the same goes, like I just said, for, you know, similar technologies that can be used in similar ways. Um, poses such a threat that there just really isn't a meaningful way to put limitations on it. There's so much potential for mission creep. So like, for example, you know, like let's make use a concrete example, right? So with college campuses, what we mostly found out when we started researching was most college campuses were not using facial recognition um, for surveillance purposes. So they weren't like tracking students and where they go around campus, et cetera. Most of them that had considered it we're using it either in the dorms as like an alternative to like swiping your card. So like you can like voluntarily upload an image of your face and then we walk up to your dorm and the door of your dorm recognizes that it's you and you can just walk in, right? Um, we also saw them using it as a payment plan um, and like, you know, you could go buy a burrito at the student cafe. Clearly I want a burrito. I think that's the third time I've mentioned the burrito today. Um, desperate we need a little counter. I want to like go to a restaurant and sit down and have someone bring me some chips. Right. Um, <laughs> anyhow, we're all losing our minds a little bit. But, um, you know, you know, you go order a burrito from the student cafe and just like get your face scanned. It knows that it's you. It deducts the money from your debit card or whatever, right? And it's like, it feels a little hard to argue with those things. It's like, well, if a student wants to upload their face to this database and like do that, like, shouldn't they be able to? But the problem is that it's so easy. It's like, you can literally flip a switch and turn something like that, that is supposed to be used as like a payment system into a surveillance system and know how many times did Evan Greer go and buy a burrito? Um, and you know, and maybe that's not that big of a deal, but if you know how many times did Evan Greer go to the student health center this week, um, how many times did Evan Greer go to the liquor store this week? How many times did Evan Greer, you know, take a walk around campus smoking a joint this week? Um, you know, not that I would do such a thing, but you know, that's, um, you know, those are the types of things where you can take something that's intended for one purpose and use it for something entirely different. Um, and so I think, um, you know, that's just an example, you know, and Bruce, uh, you know, bring Bruce Schneier back up here, but you know, Bruce has a great quote that's like, it is poor civic hygiene to, to build the infrastructure for a surveillance state um, and then just like hope that that doesn't happen, right? So I think, you know, it's so easy. You have a school that implements facial recognition in a very innocuous way for just like entry to, to dorms and things like that. And then, you know, what happens when a terrorist attack happens? What happens when there's a school shooting? What happens when there's a pandemic and then suddenly administrators are put under pressure to turn that system that was supposed to be just for entry exit into a system for surveillance. Um, and so I think we always have to be aware of that tendency. It's not just a tendency, it's an inevitability of mission creep with surveillance technologies. Um, and so really with facial recognition specifically, I, I do not see any uh, effective way of preventing it's the, the most abuse, the, the most egregious uses of it beyond banning it entirely. Sure. And, and I think one of the things I tend to try to do is compare it to environmental issues a little bit, because I think these are ecological issues. Um, so I always say, you know, when you pave a parking lot or put tarmac down, it never comes up, right? Um, yeah. And even if, if you did, it's not like you get a wetland back or something like that. Um, so but, right. well, and really, there was a great, I forget who wrote it, but someone wrote a great piece for the New York Times comparing facial recognition to lead paint which I think is really interesting too, because if you look at all these advertising, if, if you go back to when lead paint was popular, there's all these like debates back and forth where everyone's like, well, clearly this great new technology is like inevitable and like we're just going to use it everywhere. And now lead paint is banned like everywhere, right? So right. I think 
you know, anyone who tell like there's this narrative or Silicon Valley would really like us to believe like, oh, all of this is just inevitable and like, you know, get over it and like, we'll figure out ways to regulate it. Um, you know, nothing is inevitable. Um, and, and if I have anything to do with it, um, you know, this, this specifically will absolutely not be inevitable. Sure. So one of the things I used to say to people, and I have a, I have a moth that found its way in here. Um, anyway, <laughs> one of the things I used to, it's so weird to have things from outside inside. In forever, huh? yeah. yeah, right. I wish I had a moth. Oh, jeez. Um, but, um, yeah, I used to talk about Google Glass in this context, right? Because uh, people were saying, oh, it's inevitable. There's Everybody's going to be wearing glasses and they're just going to be a, a panopticon effect or a, a right. Sue's valence or wh whatever the, the terminology people were using. Um, but what worries me about the crisis we're in right now is I kind of things fights against or we're stopping for other reasons, not working very well, for example, um, certain types of surveillance, certain types of automation um, are now going to be rushed through. Uh, would you agree with that? And and if so, you know, talk about it a little bit. If not, you know, tell me why. Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right to be concerned. Um, and, you know, that's why we launched the Take This Seriously campaign that I mentioned before. Um, and, you know, we are watching like hawks um, for those types of bad proposals. You know, for, for, fortunate, I, I'm actually like, I was, I was freaking out, you know, when, when this first started and was like, oh my God, like, they're just going to go like totally wild with surveillance stuff. And in some ways, I think uh, I'm actually heartened to see, um, you know, that all the work that, and again, like, this isn't like, it's not about banking like benevolent companies like Google and Facebook or whatever, or banking benevolent politicians. This is thanks to the decades of work that privacy activists, internet freedom activists, racial justice activists, human rights activists have done to build in, you know, kind of bake into the system, people being a little skeptical about things like this. And so I, I've been heartened to see that at least some of the worst ideas do seem to be meeting significant resistance, even in, on Capitol Hill, you know, even from, you know, across the political spectrum. You know, I saw, like, you know, this isn't a surveillance thing, but I mentioned, you know, the Department of Justice um, early on in this sent a memo to Congress asking for extraordinary uh, emergency powers that would have included the ability for them to detain people indefinitely without a warrant, right, or, or without a trial, rather. Um, you know, that's something that, like, zero doctors have said like you know what we really need to fight this pandemic is for the department of justice to be able to indefinitely detain people without a warrant or without a trial i don't know why i keep saying more but um you know it's like that's a clear example that's just like that is not a public health mandate that's just an authoritarian power grab and we right away saw chuck schumer and mike lee um you know tweet you know similar things like basically like over my dead body is this going to happen right so we actually did see resistance from you know both sides of the aisle to you know some of some of the worst ideas um and again you know credit for that goes to the people who have been chipping away at this and fighting for years um to instill some basic sense of um you know the importance of privacy and civil liberties and you know but again i'm i remain very concerned i think that there it's it is inevitable that corporations will continue trying to exploit this crisis to push for more invasive practices um, or just to like make money however they can. Um, and it's inevitable that intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies will um, be playing on people's fears to try to push for more invasive practices. And we're gonna have to just fight them at every turn. But I guess I remain, you know, I'm sort of a hopeless optimist in general. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, I'm worried about things moving fast, but so far I've actually been heartened to see that we've been able to slow down some of the worst ideas. And, um, you know, and I think we just need to be, you know, continue to remain vigilant. And, you know, something like this Apple, Google contact tracing thing moves forward. We're just going to have to, you know, we will have to assume at every step that there is an opportunity for abuse, an opportunity for this to be used in ways that we don't expect. And so at every step of the way, we're going to have to be fighting for the strongest protections possible, for the strongest transparency possible, um, and and just to educate people to help understand the risks that they might be taking by participating in something like this. Sure. So we have a couple more questions here, but why don't we just uh, end on this one because I think it's uh, pretty appropriate for privacy, which is a big issue um, around healthcare in general. 
Um, what do you think about HIPAA and that as a control on contact tracing or any other real uh, gathering of data for health? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I, I, I need to kind of give myself a crash course on HIPAA, frankly. You know, I, I mean, there's there's organizations out there, I'm trying to, I should pull up the name. There's a great, um, I think it's Patient Privacy, Privacy Network, something like that. Um, so we, we had someone on uh, Twyla Bray's uh, for the questioner um, a few, I can't remember which day. It's been a long but great conference. Yeah. Um, and uh, she talked about HIPAA in the context of it being a compelled uh, disclosure framework rather than really yeah. a privacy framework. And no, that's and more or less my, my, my understanding. Yeah, yeah I, I think that that's right. Um, I mean, I think, um, you know, generally, Privacy activist T HIPAA is largely insufficient in a number of different ways. Um, I think, and I think it's it's going to be. There's just like so many different aspects of this. So just to share something, for example, and we're we're about to publish this, but a member of the Fight for the Future team tested positive for COVID nineteen, and um, mem people in their apartment complex found out about that, uh, or or rather. Their, you know, their property manager then disclosed to people in their apartment complex that someone in the apartment complex had tested positive, which I think that was perhaps appropriate. Then people started demanding, we want to know who it is, right? Um, and fortunately, their property manager did the right thing and refused to disclose who it was. But you're, this is going to come up over and over and over again. And right now, there's essentially no guidance in place. You know, you just have like, you know, it shouldn't be up to some random individual property manager or landlord or the owner of a company to just to like know what they should do if one of their employees or someone who lives there um, tests positive, right? Um, and we're you know the the sort of attitude is almost like criminalizing people who are sick, right? Um, and you know treating them as if they're like the problem instead of the victim. Um, and I think you know we're just going to need to you know there's almost like there's a legal piece there, but there's also like a cultural piece there where it's like the people in this apartment complex were almost like a torch bearing mob, like looking to like attack the person who was sick. And it's like, what are they supposed to do? They're sick, like leave them alone, you know? Um, and I, I think like, you know, in a way people are just still a little bit in denial where they're like, oh, like this isn't gonna affect me, you know? And like in a, in, in a few more weeks, like all of us are going to know multiple people who've gotten this. Um, and you know, many of the people on this call will probably have had it. We, we may have already had it um, and not even know. And so I think just, you know, there's there's both legal work and legislative work, but also cultural work to do to just like try to get people to think critically about what are we gonna do as a society to take care of each right. other um, in this very difficult moment. Well, I mean, I just coughed twice on the stream, right? Okay. Um, and I've had sort of a persistent cough for a few weeks now, and I don't know what to make of it symptom-wise. Um, I can't even get testing if I wanted to, right? Uh, and we do have a mobile testing center now in, in New Haven, Connecticut, where I am, uh, one of the few places that does. Um, but I'm not supposed to go in, unless it's a drastic thing, right? And I probably shouldn't uh, use up a test that, that should be used on someone else. Um, so anyway, yeah, the, the dehumanizing and sort of... Um, I don't want to say discrimination yet, but I don't know what other word to use um, against sick people and sort of this generational thing. So, so I guess that's a question. Um, we're going to see a generation of people, and, and we'll end on this one for real. Um, we're going to see a generation of people coming out of this um, who this is the world they're in, right? Um, and they're used to the electronic tools, whatever we end up having. Um, they're used to the world being shaped by this pandemic. Um, and they may be used to the idea that an entire generation of people is just gone. Um, so, you know, not to be too heavy at the end, but, um, you know, what what do you think may happen, you know, from a generational sense and, and our role in that, right? Because we're sort of in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, um, I see tremendous threat and tremendous opportunity, you know, and I mean, as a parent, you know, like I mentioned, I'm, I'm raising a nine-year-old and we're homeschooling and, it's interesting seeing the world through her eyes a bit, um, and just like I think, um, I think there's two there's two things. That, you know, I think one is that um, there's real threat. Like the world could be about to get a lot worse, um, a lot more authoritarian, a lot uh, more unjust. But there's also ways in which this crisis is kind of ripping the bandaid off or exposing ways in which our society has 
been profoundly unjust um, and that in a lot of ways, um, our economic and political systems have been a crisis for large numbers of people for a long time. Um, and you know, all you have to do is ask someone who lived in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina um, or who lives in um, Detroit or Baltimore or St. Louis, um, you know, whether like, you know, this, this is a brand new crisis or a crisis that has been a crisis. And I, so my hope is that there's also opportunity in this moment to reshape our society and build a world that actually works for everyone um, and, and protects people's basic rights and freedoms. And so, you know, I, I'm scared and worried about the future, um, but I also, you know, I do maintain that, that at least some semblance of, of optimism, not a naive optimism that like we can just sit back and hope things go okay, um, but a sort of active optimism of like, I'm gonna do everything in my small amount of power to fight for that world that I want my child to grow up in. And, um, and you know, and I'm not gonna sleep at night unless I think I'm doing a good job at that. Um, and then I just have to trust that there's enough other people that are gonna be doing the same thing um, and, and recognize and believe that throughout human history, um, humans have faced enormous challenges, um, but have also, you know, at different times worked together to overthrow um, systems that um, were not serving humanity. And so I hope that this is a, a moment um, where we can do that. Awesome. Well, we'll leave it there. That's an incredible message to end on here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me and thanks for organizing this and, um, and best wishes to everyone. And, and, you know, if folks are interested, you know, feel free to follow me on Twitter or reach out to Fight for the Future. Um, you know, we're a very small organization. We definitely rely on donations and things like that. So definitely sign up as a monthly donor if you can. And, um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks again. I appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you. Well, take care, y'all.